Good morning, my name is John Allen. I am the pastor of Risen Church here in Virginia Beach, and this marks the sixth week of our uh, not being able to physically gather together as a result of the pandemic that we are all in. Um, and yes, I am counting because I am very much looking forward to gathering with you all. But thankfully, we have been blessed with the technology to gather together online. And so uh, there is something that unites us together. Um, it is actually so much more powerful than technology. Um, and that is the Holy Spirit. And so although we're not able to gather together physically right now, um, which is what we want most, we are able to gather together in spirit. And so while I'm not there with you physically, I am with you in spirit. And so with that in mind, in light of that reality, before we dive into the word of God, let's go to him in prayer and unite in the spirit of God. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are not bound by time nor space. We thank you that you are sovereign over this situation. We thank you for Easter. We thank you for this week. We thank you that you are here with us, Father. I pray that you would meet us in every living room, in every vehicle, that you would go before us um, right now and, and, and just go ahead and begin to ignite a flame for your word in our hearts. Soften our hearts with your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that um, in the midst of this pandemic, you would you would uh, do something extraordinary in our hearts, in our lives, in the church, that you would grow the church into who you've created us to be, that you're calling each and every person listening this to listening to this um, to a deeper relationship with you. And so, Father, I pray that you would meet us right where we are. Lord, I pray that it, as I decrease, you would increase within me. Father, I pray that you would speak prophetically through me. And I pray that if there's anyone in here or, or anyone that's listening and joining with us, um, this morning, that they would not end their time with us this morning without having fully surrendered to you as their Lord, their King, their Savior, saturated in your presence and your word. God, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, things just keep on keeping on. Uh, with this pandemic. So we just celebrated Easter online. It was a great time. Uh, it, we joined together with Salt Church. I hope you got a chance to check that out. Um, if not, it is online. We were celebrating the resurrection. It was so much fun. Uh, we actually had more than a thousand people that tuned in for that online celebration. And now I just want to thank you all again for all of the um, participation, for all the teams that gathered together, all the participants that pulled that service off. Um, it was a great time and, and uh, so many who shared and liked and commented and engaged in it. Um, we brought the good news to a lot of people, um, and we were able to really just celebrate God and, and the glory of the gospel. And so um, we believe that as we continue to do this, that God's going to use even this circumstance for our eternal good. So if you're joining with us for the first time this morning, I want to specifically welcome you um, and encourage you to fill out an online connect card. We have that on our website and that should be available to you. Uh, it really is easy in this season to operate sort of as a disengaged spectator. Um, so we want to do everything that we can to get you connected. It's more important than just some weird sales pitch. That's not what we're about. What we are about is the gospel. What we are about is the community. It's being connected in authentic community that points you to the word and spirit of God during a season like this. It isn't just a perk. This is a matter of life and death. See, church was never designed to be a place that you go. It's designed to be a people that you belong with. God has given the church to us for that and to that end, for his mission, for his purpose. So God never designed his church to be just a place for consumers to come for entertainment. That's not what it's about. Or spectators to just watch from a distance. And so in this season, it's going to be more important than ever to really be intentional in engaging. And so Church, again, is a people who are rallying around the Word of God and the presence of God for the purpose of God in their lives and for the lives of those around them. So no matter what our circumstances are, this is what we're about. So this morning, right out of the gate, I just want to encourage you to take your first step. Take that first step. Fill out that Connect card online. Um, we also have a gift that we'd love to send to you. Uh, and so we want you to be intentional. We want to be intentional with you. Um, and let us connect with you. It really does matter. We're not going to spam you or anything like that. So don't let your new normal be a dark and lonely isolation. We want to join with you. So these past six weeks have been very extraordinary, right? 
So rhythms have been shaken in almost every facet of everyday life all across the globe. It's not just here, it's everywhere. And so I know that for many, there was a, a, a sort of a, a hope that was attached to Easter Sunday as well. Um, I know a lot of people were looking forward to, with expectation, sort of a victory that was building. There was an expectation, I know there was for me, like there was going to be a deliverance from a lot of the chaos. Um, Easter has a lot of that kind of hope attached to it, right? I mean, Easter Sunday, it comes and it's like, yeah! And then it goes and here we are again, right? It, it, it's continued. The pandemic is still here. Businesses are still closed. Restrictions haven't been lifted. They've only been extended. So the death toll continues to rise. I mean, now the, the rhetoric from our leaders is that we need to adopt a new normal. I'm sure you've heard that. If you're listening to the news or anything, you're hearing this phrase, a new normal, but none of this feels normal. It doesn't feel normal to me. It, it, it's very much extraordinary. The whole thing feels extraordinary. Like there's some, something that's just not right about this whole thing. Like it's got a lot of people feeling like there's something much bigger going on. Like there's just something that's just not right. Something's off about this whole thing. I've even heard people, some say, that they might actually... Uh, that, that they think we might actually be in the end times that Jesus talked about. Now, that's a big word, right? The end times. It's like, dun 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 dun, right? The end. Um, I, I've had a lot of people ask me about that. What do I think? Do you think it could be the end, the end of the world, the end times, the end of the age? Could we be in the end times? Well, here's my answer it might not be what you're expecting. You ready? If I had a drum, I'd do the snare and the whole thing, the drum roll, but I don't have it, so just deal with it. Here it is. We are in the end times. That's a reality. In fact, we've been in the end times. And we've been seeing reality, that reality, unfold all around us. We often just choose to ignore it. You see, until something like a global pandemic breaks out or rumors of nuclear war start swirling, people don't even think about the end times. Some say, well, you know, what about all the tribulations and the persecution that's supposed to happen in the church? Ladies and gentlemen, just because it's not happening on Virginia Beach Boulevard doesn't mean it's not happening in this world, all across the world, all across the globe. In fact, throughout the world, the massive majority of the global church, as Jesus sees it, is not just in America. And many of them are suffering extreme persecutions even as we speak. Now, I do think that things will intensify, but we are in the end times. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that in America, that we're not in any danger. You see, I'm not talking about um, danger from the government here, though. You see, in fact, in many ways, the spiritual danger in America is higher precisely because of our comfort level and the apathy that it breeds towards our need for Jesus and reliance upon the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked a lot about this, and I don't mean like in these hidden metaphors that nobody can kind of understand or decipher. I, I, he's not, I'm not talking about like the, in code or something. I'm talking about the way he spoke with clarity and intentionality on what it would be like in the end times, and that Jesus knew that we would endure pandemics and wars and economic hardship, and that none of this is a shock to him. He gives actually clear instruction. Even during the last week of his life, he gives clear instruction about how we are to live in the midst of it all. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about what you need to do to thrive, what you need specifically to thrive in the end times, because like it or not, we're in them. So now, a lot of things might come to mind, right? When you think about being prepared for the end of the age, you might think of stuff like doomsday preppers. Have you seen that on Discovery Channel? It's these people where they have like these huge fallout bunkers in their backyard, like they've gotten backhoes and stuff, and nobody knows about it, but they've got like a bunker where they're, you know, got everything tied down, they've got enough food for years, they're stockpiled with gas masks and canned food and water filters and all kinds of jugs, an arsenal of weapons and a box of gold or something. You know, I might be actually describing some of you a little bit more accurately than you want to admit, but um, the close of the age and the return of Jesus Christ 
as the true king of creation to judge the living and the dead isn't just some reality TV show. It's not just a fairy tale myth. It's a very genuine and very imminent reality that Jesus himself spoke about extensively. And so he talks about his return as the rightful king of all creation. You see, while he won the victory at the cross over sin and death, there would be a time between his resurrection and his return where things he said are going to get pretty chaotic. He warned us about this. In fact, he compared creation to a groaning woman in labor. It doesn't get much more intense than that. He, he, he said it would be like cycles or contractions that intensify until the full deliverance and the arrival of the promised son. That image is very sort of visceral for a reason. Jesus promised that there would be tribulation and trials and suffering, famine, wars, rumors of wars, plague, economic hardship. If you didn't realize that this is what the four horsemen of the Revelation uh, or, or the four horsemen of the apocalypse that Revelation talks about, now you know. That's what it's speaking of. We've seen these things on a mass scale throughout the past 2,000 years of history. And Christ's prophecy has actually been proven to be accurate on a scale that even the Romans of that time couldn't have even fathomed. And in this passage that we're going to be in this morning, Jesus tells us that the one thing that we need is what we need not only to survive in the end times, but to thrive in the midst of it all as his beloved people. Jesus makes it clear that there is something available to Christians and something available to only Christians that can not only help you endure a pandemic, but to be blessed by it. It's pretty radical. See, there's something available to Christians in suffering that not only helps us through it, but can cause us to consider it pure joy. Something that allows us to not only survive, but thrive when things get difficult. And that thing is actually not a thing at all. It's the person and presence of the Holy Spirit. And more specifically, what we're going to get into this morning here is the oil of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is probably one of the most important principles in the Bible, if not the most important principle in the Bible. And I, I want you to get this, because if you don't, you're going to have a, you may have a very rude awakening when Jesus comes back. And he is coming back. That is a reality. My question for you is, does that excite you? Or does that scare you? That's a really important question. So we're going to read a parable of a story or, or a parable or a story that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 13. That's where we're going to be. Um, you may know this parable as the parable of the ten virgins or, or the ten bridesmaids. But before we go there, I, I want to give you some important context for this parable. See, this parable is situated um, directly in between, uh, right after chapter 24 in Matthew. And chapter 24 and 25 are the recordings of Jesus' primary teaching on the end times. And there's more in these two chapters about the end of the age than anywhere else in the Gospels. And this is Jesus' final teaching before the Last Supper, right before the cross. So um, we've been focused on that for the past few weeks. And so this week, we're diving into this as he starts off chapter 24, talking about being able to identify the, the times that you're in. And then, after he does that, he starts talking about the end times, and then he tells four parables or symbolic stories that all have to do with the church in the end times. He even tells us that, that he's speaking, uh, or he even tells those that he's speaking to um, that their generation will not end, that they won't taste death until they experience the very things he's talking about. So he's not talking about something that's going to happen way later. He's talking about this end time church, not as something that's way far off in the future, but is very near, even to the people he was talking to at that point, 2,000 years ago. So Jesus was about to set this whole thing in motion with his death and resurrection. So let's take a look at these four parables. We're going to look at them all together, and then we're going to drop back and hone in on the, the third parable that he tells. 
Um, and, and I want you to get a full picture of what's going on. So real quick, here are the four parables. I'm not going to go through them. I'm just going to summarize them real quick. The first one he tells is about a fig tree in Matthew 24, verse 32. He basically tells them to be aware of the season that you're in, that it matters because most people aren't going to pay attention. But Jesus is clear when he says, pay attention. He says, watch. He says, be vigilant. If you don't, then you won't be ready for his return. And the point of all of this is so that we will be ready. So now this kind of warning flies directly in the face of sort of shallow and superficial Christianity. As Richard Foster put it, he said it like this, Superficiality is the crisis of our age. The doctrine of instant satisfaction... I can't speak anymore for some reason. <laughs> I'm going to start over. The superficiality is the crisis of our age. The doctrine of instant satisfaction is a primary spiritual problem. The desperate need today is not for more intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people. Jesus issues this warning of wake up, watch, and pray as the pointed warning to the church in the end times. He says, lean in. Let God engage your heart and your mind. Over and over, he says these things. It's not about fear, it's about vigilance. It's about discernment. In 2 Timothy 3, 5, it, it, he talks about, um, the author talks about those who have the appearance of godliness, but they've denied its power. That they look like they're legit, but they deny the gravity of relationship with God, which is where the power is. The very thing that Jesus paid for on the cross and bought through the resurrection, paved the way for, is this access to knowing and enjoying God, His Word, His presence. This is the Gospel. This is what He did for us. He says that without that, you're just empty. So Jesus said this will be a very real issue with those who call themselves Christians during the end times. So if this describes your relationship with God, then you need a new normal. Say that. Say, I need a new normal. <laughs> we need a new normal. I need a new normal. You need a no new normal. We need to constantly be making our relationship with Jesus newer and fresher and deeper and, a, and that become the normal part of our lives. And I believe that this period of quarantine or pandemic or whatever you call it can be an opportunity for a new normal in Christ Jesus. So it's a matter, this is not just something to, to, to endure. It's a matter of eternal life and eternal death. So the second parable that starts in Matthew 24, verse 45, Jesus talks about a master whose return is delayed and how that delay exposes the hearts of the servants he set over his household. Again, it's a warning that some will be faithful and wise and care for his people and steward them well. And then there's another who's shown to be wicked. And the pressures of the delay expose bitterness and disappointment in his heart. And this other servant ends up being mean and resentful. He beats the other servants and he's domineering over the ones that are in his care. He's getting drunk all the time. Luke's version in Luke 21, verse 34 through 35, says this, But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation, which is kind of like overindulgence, and drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place, and to stand before the Son of Man. And Jesus is that Son of Man. He's referring to His return. The pressures of leading and loving people created hard hearts in these wicked servants. Instead of having thick skin and soft hearts, they developed thin skin and hard hearts. They became cruel and mean-spirited, suspicious, combative, insecure, filled with anxiety, and self-centered. This is what the delay caused during the end times as they awaited his return. And then the third parable that Jesus tells is about the end times again. 
And this is the one that we're going to be honing in on this morning. It's a parable of the ten bridesmaids that are, these ten bridesmaids that are awaiting a bridegroom to arrive so the wedding feast can begin. Five are wise, five are foolish. Five are ready for the coming bridegroom, but five are not. And the thing that separates these wise, the wise ones from the foolish ones, is this oil that represents the Holy Spirit or intimate relationship with God. And then the fourth that's situated in these four parables about the end time church, the fourth parable is a parable of the talents. It's a parable that speaks to serving God rather than your own significance. Even when it's hard, even when you think the impact is small, it talks about trusting that obedience and faithfulness carries the greatest reward of all. That in the end times, it's especially those days of difficulty when we press through for God's glory that are most valuable to Him. And that's what will have the greatest reward attached to it in the age to come. These, par- these parables are fascinating. They're beautiful. They're powerful. I don't have time to get into all of it. But to summarize it all, I mean, it's just the, the impact, when the impact is insignificant. A- again, how do you stay faithful when things are difficult and the impact seems small? How do you keep your passion stoked and affections warm when the master delays? How do you stay alert? How do you stay watchful and vigilant in the darkest part of the night? How do you engage your mind and engage your heart at the same time? Not just either or, but both. How do you do this? See, it's the third parable here that we're going to hone in on that answers all of it for us. So turn with me to Matthew 25, verse 1 through 13. And I'm going to start here, Matthew 25, I'm going to look at verse 1. So read with me here. It says this, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. So you got ten young girls here, and they've been chosen Uh, sort of as an honor to welcome the bridegroom on behalf of the bride. A wedding is coming, engagement has happened or betrothal, it's already taken place and the bridegroom would have gone away to prepare a place for his bride and then he would be returning to kick off the wedding, this big wedding feast, everyone would have had a huge party, these festivities, it would have been a huge important event and they had the honor of welcoming him as he returned to introduce him to the bride, to prepare her for the bridegroom. It's a clear picture of Jesus returning for his church. We see this throughout the New Testament, the Old Testament, uh, uh, the New Testament and Revelation. And so now remember that Jesus is teaching about the end times. And so in the end times, Christians will be like these bridesmaids. They're shining their light in the dark as they await the return of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. And his return will then usher in a huge heavenly wedding feast. So verse 2, five of these bridesmaids were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. So these bridesmaids had these lamps that would have needed oil to fuel the flame. It would have had sort of a a wick on the end like a candle has. And that wick would have been dipped in oil. And so you could light that wick and it would burn even without the oil. If you didn't have oil, that wick will still burn, but it won't burn very long. It'll just sort of flash for a little bit, but it won't be a sustainable burn. It might even look really bright at first. But in order for it to be a long-lasting, legitimate burn that gives off long-lasting, legitimate light, that wick needed to be dipped, saturated, soaked in oil as fuel for that lamp. So the picture Jesus paints for us of what the church will look like in the end times is that there will be a large amount of Christians shining their light in expectation of Christ's return. But there's also going to be a shockingly large amount who start off the same way, They have the appearance of looking like the wise and faithful Christians that they're intermingled with, but there's one major thing that's different. They aren't connected to the one that actually sustainably fuels their flame to give them light in the dark. They have no oil. And that is what makes all the difference. Now you need to realize that throughout the scriptures, oil represents the Holy Spirit. It represents anointing. It represents the presence of God. And in this parable, these five foolish bridesmaids have the appearance of godliness, but it's empty, it's dry, and it's destined to simply burn out 
or fizzle out. So verse 5, as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. So Jesus makes it clear in almost all of these parables that his return will be delayed. It's taken longer than anyone thought it would. He promised that would happen. But that delay exposes the foolish and the wise, the legitimate from the illegitimate believers. Verse 6, But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Now, this seems like an odd time to start a wedding, right? Midnight? But Jesus makes it clear, again, throughout all of these parables and in these two chapters, Jesus made it clear that nobody knows the time or the hour when he will return. That's why we are to be ready, watchful, vigilant, prepared, expectant, hopeful, I think even excited. Verse 7, Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. Meaning, they got ready. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. So the wise were prepared because they had the oil. The foolish weren't, they had no fuel, and they had no light. Maybe they foolishly were thinking that they could borrow it from the others. But here's the thing. If this is about relationship, if this is about the Holy Spirit, if this is about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you can't borrow that. That's non-transferable. That is personal. You see, this isn't about doing enough or, 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 or earning your way into heaven. This is about trust. This is about faith. This is about intimacy. It's about knowing God and being known by Him. It's about love. At the end of the day, we're talking about a bride and a bridegroom. It's about receiving His grace on a personal and intimate level knowing the God of creation. This is what we've been given access to. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, your association with someone who has an intimate relationship with Jesus isn't going to cut it. That's not what it's about. You can't borrow that. You can't share that. Your grandparents' relationship with God is not going to be enough to cover you. Having Christian friends and going to church every now and then, that's not what it's about. Those things are a symptom of having a heart that loves Jesus and His people and His purpose. Verse 9, But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the virgins, the other bridesmaids, came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. It was too late. The oil is a representation of intimacy with God through his Holy Spirit. He didn't know them. It's a decidedly final statement. This is not the only place that Jesus references this scenario. They didn't know him. They were not filled with his Holy Spirit. They had no relationship, no interaction. They had no heritage in him. Their lights were not shining. They had no passion for him and his purpose to make disciples who make disciples to be disciples and make them to the ends of the earth. This wasn't on their radar. They weren't ready for his return. And then Jesus closes his parable with a pointed and repeated warning. Verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So this is one of, if not the most sobering teacher that the, teaching that the Bible gives us. On the outside, you can't tell the difference. They were committed intellectually. They were committed even socially. These bridesmaids were intermingled amongst each other. They had the form of religion. They would have called themselves Christians even. Right? In our day and time, they would have been, they would have considered themselves Christians. They they probably, you know, maybe prayed the sinner's prayer, maybe raised their hand at some point. Outwardly, they probably even seemed like good people. You know? But inwardly, their faith was dead. Their affections toward God and his word and his people had grown cold. Their light burned out. They were empty on the inside. 
Just empty lamps intermingled with the others. Jesus talked about this a lot. He talked about how the wheat and the weeds would grow up together in the last days, but the weeds wouldn't be pulled up until it was time for the harvest because he didn't want to destroy the wheat. But on the day of judgment, the wheat and the weeds would be separated. He talked about churches in Revelation who had no love for God, even though they knew all the right doctrines and all the right theologies. Theologically, intellectually, they understood, but they had no relationship with him. They had all the appearances, but they did not have relationship with God, which is what the oil represents. They didn't have the fuel. And then it says in Revelation, he would remove their lampstands. Because they were empty, they had no light, they had no flame, because they had no oil. He talked about seeds that would spring up but get choked out by the thorns, burned up by the heat, or eaten by birds, because they didn't have deep roots. Guys, this is a very real theme throughout the Bible, especially in Christ's teaching. Do not be deceived Look, I actually believe that we are in the midst of a very real revival. And I think it's a revival that's unlike many we've seen before, if any. I think, I'm not talking about a big flashy revival where thousands of hands are going up to make decisions to follow Jesus. Look, I love those things. There's nothing wrong with that. Trust me. I, I've been a part of those things. Praise God for those movements. I've poured much of my life into those kinds of movements. I've seen thousands upon thousands of decisions to follow Jesus. And I'm not exaggerating those numbers. I've served and led in movements that were standing room only. Nine services every Sunday. I've been involved where thousands of decisions were made to follow Jesus. Recorded. Even followed up with. Lines wrapped around the block to get into service after service after service. That's what I thought revival would look like. I always believed that that's what revival would look like. And again, hear me. Praise God for that. I don't regret one ounce of sacrificing for those things and pouring out in the service and pouring out to those types of movements. But as a pastor, I'm telling you, God has called me to be accountable for those in my care. And that is you. If you're in our church, that's you. And in the past 20 plus years of my walk with Jesus, over time, I have to admit that this 5 out of 10 number isn't as, ex as extreme as I initially thought it was. Unfortunately, I've seen so many people that have made that decision. So many people who have come out of the gate with a flame just burning and it just fizzled out. You see, true revival isn't about just one time decision. True revival is about hearts filled with the Spirit of God and on fire for His glory and His kingdom and His purpose. No matter what the cost, it's saying, you're king, I'm not. It's saying, I don't even, I can't even stoke my own passion for you. I need you, and I need to lean in, and I want that oil. I want that spirit. I need it. It's people developing a new normal, surrendering to the new normal of relationship with Jesus Christ through his word, in worship, in prayer, in community. This is what it's about. And let me tell you something. I believe we're in the midst of that type of revival. I really do. See, the oil in this parable represents, again, relationship with the Holy Spirit and intimacy with God. It represents being plugged in, connected, saturated, yoked up in His love and grace and truth. Remember, this is a wedding feast. It's a parable about a bridegroom and a bride. And, and Scripture talks about not being unequally yoked with unbelievers. And so when the bridegroom yokes up with his bride, guess what? That bride is not unequally yoked. She's passionate. She is submitted to the mission that he has. She wants to come after his purpose. She wants to come after the things that he cares the most about. And so when Jesus comes back for his bride, guess what? He's coming back for those who love the things that he loves. He's coming back for those who are passionate about the expansion of the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. Now, not just one day later, but now. That's what he's about. Disciples who are about making disciples, who are about making disciples, who are about fulfilling the Great Commission. That's what the local church is, ladies and gentlemen. That's what Christianity is. And so I've got four things, guys. I've got four things that we're going to close with that the oil of the Spirit does. Four things. There's way more than four, okay? But I've just got four for you here. 
And then we're going to close again with how you can tap into that. So one, the first thing that the oil of the Spirit does is it fuels your light. This is the image here. We are called to be a light to the world. Guys, this isn't just for pastors. This isn't just for the professional Christians. It's such a weird term anyway. This is for all Christians. People get so confused with this whole call to ministry thing. You are all called to ministry. If you are a Christian, you are called to ministry. That's what this thing is about. All of us. If you don't think you have a ministry, then you very well may not be a Christian. You've been strategically situated and filled with His Spirit to make disciples who make disciples. This is the glory of this thing. You've been given a purpose. It's intentional and it's strategic. Again, it's not about how big or how many, but you do have a ministry. It may be your family. It may be your neighbors. It may be all of the above. You may be called to the vocation of pastor one day. That's a beautiful, noble, and in some ways daunting calling to equip, though, the ministries, to equip the saints for ministry, to equip ministers. That's you. And so God has strategically positioned you to shine the light of his grace and truth in love to those around you. And that light is always the overflow of your intimacy with his word and with his presence. Without that, you're like a light bulb with no electricity. You're just unplugged, unconnected, and ineffective. You need to get plugged in and turned on. Otherwise, you just have the appearance of godliness, but you have denied its power. And 2 Timothy 3.5 says, avoid such people. That's real. It's a superficial faith with no substance. It's about engaging your heart and your head. That's what, that's what Jesus is about. That's what the Spirit of God is about. Praying and watching. Heart and head, head and heart, leaning into his word and spirit, not one without the other. He can't have one without the other. Not legitimately. This is what keeps that flame roaring with his consuming fire in your life. Some people say this is not the kind of message that grows the church, right? You hear that all the time. And I, I, I you know, that may be correct, right? It may not spark an appearance of growth, it's just a flash in the pan for engaging those that, that what they want to hear. But it's exactly what catalyzes the true growth of Christ's church. See, I think this is exactly the kind of message that grows the church. The true church. The almighty army united in Christ that terrifies the powers and principalities and rulers of this dark age. You see, when we engage... When we engage and we are filled with His Spirit, when that becomes the overflow and the characteristic of the local church, with that is how we plunder hell and populate heaven. This is how we operate as the light into the world. It's all the overflow of the oil of His Spirit, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. Which, by the way, is what that means. This is true prosperity. Second, the oil of the Spirit fuels your strength to endure to the end. One of my prayers has been, and many of you heard me say this, that God would develop in me thick skin and a soft heart. I've noticed that the more you're involved in church, and the more you do church life, and the more you're involved with Christians who are being sanctified, and you're dealing with wheat and tares often, or wheat and weeds sometimes, is that there's either one of two routes that people go. They either develop thin skin and a hard heart or thick skin and a soft heart. And thin, th that thick skin and soft heart can only come through intimacy with Jesus through his Holy Spirit. See, when disappointments and setbacks come and, and, and chains of disappointment and depression and despair and those things try to ensnare you, see, the oil of his Spirit is what breaks those holds that those chains have on you. It's like you slip right out of them. It's like, they can't, it's like the enemy can't get a grasp on you. You see, whether disease or depression, divorce or disappointment, when you're soaked in the oil of His Spirit, it's like they just slip off. Those chains can't get a grip because they've lost the power to label you and condemn you. His Spirit gives you the grace to stand and walk out of all bondage. This is the new normal. This is the new normal that we all need to let the God of all comfort soak our lives in. This is the anointing that gives you strength to endure to the end. It's like a boxer. 
You ever seen them put Vaseline all over a boxer's face in a fight? It's when the, the, it's like they get hit. You're gonna get hit, but it's just it doesn't have the same impact. It's like it just kind of glances off. Look, you're gonna get hit, but it's with the oil of the spirit. It takes the edge off. It allows you to finish the race, to finish the fight, to run your race, and to do it with great joy. His spirit is also called the oil of gladness for a reason. So the third thing that the oil of the spirit does is this. Number three, it gives you rest and contentment in the midst of the chaos. Notice that all ten bridesmaids, not just the five foolish, but all ten bridesmaids fall asleep. Both the wise and the foolish fall asleep. But the, the sleep of the wise is very different. The sleep of the foolish is sort of an inebriated foolishness, right? They're not prepared. they got no business sleeping. But the sleep of the wise is very different. They were able to rest easy knowing their flasks were full of oil. They were ready. That's what being filled with the Spirit does for you. That's what knowing Jesus does for us. That's what really knowing Him, it swallows our anxieties in His sovereign and unconditional love. Being a child of the Most High King. Psalm 127, verse 1 through 2 puts it like this. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives his beloved sleep. Guys, there is no sleep like the sleep of God's beloved children. I'm telling you, this is such an impactful verse. I don't think I've ever read this verse without tearing up. This is where it counts. This is knowing Christ in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the dark. This is what fuels your light. This is what gives us endurance. This is what allows us to be content in the midst of the chaos. This is what allows us to say, I consider it pure joy, even when I face trials of many kinds, because He's with you. He's doing something in you. This leads me to the fourth. Number four, the oil of the Spirit stokes your passion and fuels the fire of your affections. This is not something that's transferable. I can't give this to you. You can be inspired. You can look at this and you go, oh, he's so moved. That's great. But my hope is that it inspires you to go to the source. You can't live off my relationship with Jesus. To truly have your heart ignited with this kind of consuming fire, you got to get it straight from Him. The foolish bridesmaids thought they could wait. They thought it didn't matter. They thought they could get it from someone when, it, when they needed it. Maybe last rites or something, I don't know. But Christianity is not about saying some weird incan incantation or some sinner's prayer at the last moment. It's not some magical password that gets you into heaven. It's not what this is about. I've heard so many people say that before they die, that they're going to get right with the Lord. One day. One day then. But guys, that is a symptom that you don't care about Him. And if you don't care about Him now, what makes you think you're going to care about Him then? If you don't have any desire for His rule and reign in your life now, what makes you think that your heart's going to get any softer? Nothing on this planet captivates my heart more than the glory of God does. My soul longs for His return. There's nothing on this planet that captivates my heart more. I've heard some say that they're not ready for Christ to return yet because they have things that they want to do. They have things they want to experience. Look, I got three kids. I love them to death. I'm married. I got a great life. I got a great church. I love seeing all the things and experience. I love life. I really do. But I'm going to tell you something. I can't wait for Jesus to come back. I cannot wait. Look, if you have something on this planet that you want to accomplish other than the Great Commission, then that thing's an idol. That's something you want more than you want Jesus. Because don't you realize that all of your relationships, all of the good experiences that you experience in this life will be 7,000 times greater when He comes back? 
all of the relationships that you have. The real question isn't, are you ready? Well, no, the real question is, are you ready for that? No more pretentious religion. No more superficial ignorance. No more taking grace for granted. Instead of asking what you can get away with, tap into the oil of his spirit, begin to cry out for what makes, it gives him the most glory. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Do you long for the coming of the risen Lord? I pray you do. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it talks about examining yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. It actually says to test yourselves, to look at your heart, to realize whether or not Christ is really actually in you. Some of you may need to develop a new normal of tapping into the oil of the Holy Spirit. I think all of us can increase in that. Are you reading your Bibles? Do you care? Or do you think it's some kind of like legalistic thing? It's the Word of God. I'm not just talking about going through the motions. Yeah, that, that can be a legalistic thing if you think that just having five quiet times a day is what's going to get you into heaven. That's silly. <laughs> but it's posturing yourself before the Lord that true intimacy can actually take place. It's prioritizing Him. Are you praying to Him? Are you letting Him in? Are you surrendering to Him? Are you letting Him shape and mold and strip away the things that are not glorifying to Him? Do you have a community of friends who love and encourage you and pray for you and point you to Jesus? This is what the church is. Are you a part of the church? Are you partnering in the gospel with a covenant community of people? People who love God's word and his presence and want to love you with that same fire that they're loved with from Christ himself. Are you falling deeper in love with what God loves? When's the last time you wept over the goodness of God? I want to encourage you to ask yourself to pray about that. I don't think this is a personality-driven thing. It's just worship, and you were designed for it. Do you sing to Him? Do you worship to Him? Do you cry out to, you, to Him? Not to get, just, just to get stuff from Him, but just because He's so good. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know Jesus like that. It's available to us all. In fact, if you haven't already listened to the worship video that we've put in the um, links, I want you to click on the link and I want you to spend some time just praising Jesus. Just being captivated by His goodness. And then I want to encourage you to connect in a Zoom group. We have these available to you. This is community. It matters. And I, I want to encourage you to fill out a connect card online if you haven't already. See, you weren't designed to do this alone. My prayer is that this season would institute a new normal of longing for the oil of His Spirit in us all. This is the difference between thriving and surviving. It's the difference between eternal death and eternal life. And it's available only through Jesus Christ. Maybe you don't know Jesus at all. Maybe you're an empty lamp. Or maybe you've just been blatantly rejecting this thing outright the whole time. Look, both are lost. Whether you have the appearance of godliness or you're flat out rejecting blatantly the king of the universe. Both are lost. It doesn't matter whether you pretend or not. Neither are welcomed into the wedding feast. Neither are true Christians. But it's not too late for either of you. Neither one. It's not, at this point, the door hasn't been shut. The invitation's on the table. The oil is available. This life in Christ is about way more than just a prayer, but it does start with one. <laughs> That prayer does matter. So I, I, I want to encourage you to pray with me as I pray this prayer as we go before the King of Eternity. Let's pray. Father, God, we confess that this life, this world, this darkness, it can distract us, it can preoccupy us, it can overwhelm us. We can get so caught up in our own agendas that we totally miss out on the things that matter, the one thing that matters. And like you said about Mary and Martha, as Mary sat at your feet, she has chosen the thing that matters. God, I pray that we would be a people that sit at your feet, that drink deeply of your grace, soak us in the oil of your spirit, God. 
I pray that our church would be saturated during this time, during this pandemic, that we would see this world around us as you see it. That it would create a moment for us to engage and to be sanctified and for you to be glorified and for your church to revive with the beauty and the grace and the love and the glory that you have called us to before the foundations of the earth. God, I pray for those that are listening. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to just pray with me right now and say, God, I am have fallen short. I'm a sinner. God, I need you. I don't have what it takes to live this life the way you've called me to live it. I can't do it on my own. I need you and I need your people to surround me and walk through this with me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. God, I believe in what you did for me at the cross. I believe that you died for my sins and paid the punishment. You took the penalty that I deserved. And that you conquered death in the grave. You rose from the dead. And you paved the way to eternal life that starts now. Fill me up with your spirit. God, I'm making you the Lord of my life. Even when I don't understand. Even when I fall short. Meet me there. And walk with me. And surround me with people who can love me with your spirit. God, thank you. I confess that today I am a Christian. Lord, walk with me and fill me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to hear about it. I want you to email admin at risenchurchvb.com. And and we have Zoom meetings that are happening at 11 o'clock this Sunday. We want you to, I want to encourage you to join in all of them. Actually, my wife and I will be available to speak with any of you. Um, Whether you made a decision to follow Jesus or you just want to connect, we'd love to connect with you. Um, Don't forget to fill out that connect card. Um, And don't forget to click on the worship link that we have uh, listed as well. Um, It's really powerful. Uh, I want you to actually, as we close, I want you to take time. I want you to pray. If you're with your spouse, I want you to pray with them. If you're with a friend, I want you to pray with them. And, And if you're alone, I just want you to pray. I want you to pray to the Lord. Acknowledge Him. Ask for that oil of His Spirit to fill you up. And so I also want to um, encourage you, if you're, if you're in our church, I, if, you know, this is a season where um, giving has, uh, inevitably it, it drops in a season like this. Um, and if you're a first-time guest with us or you're just joining us, then I, I, look, I don't want you to feel compelled to give right now. We believe that faith is the currency of heaven. Um, and so, I, I, you know, if you are a partner with us or if you're just joining with us and you do feel like God has put it on your heart to give, then I want to encourage you to do that. In fact, if you um, have been blessed with the resources during this season, um, I, I would encourage you to pick up and bear the burdens that others aren't able to in this season and, and so that our church can go forward with the vision that God has placed before us in a financial way. So we consider giving an opportunity for worship. We believe that God is going to take care of us and move it forward. And so this is an invitation for you to partner with us in that. Um, And and we do believe that it is something. We give not so that we can get from God, but we give because he's given us everything that we need for life and godliness and to worship him. And so I want to encourage you to give. um, But, uh, yeah, again, we want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. We want to join with you. We want to partner with you. And so with that, I'll leave you with this. Now unto him who is able to do abundantly more than anything we can ask, think, or imagine according to the power at work within you. Go with God. You are commissioned. See you soon.